Um, Ted Hoy, thanks for coming in on the Base podcast. I, every time I interview someone, meet someone, I, I tell them they're based. But I think mm. you taking on the Chinese Communist Party makes you the most based person we've had so far. <laughs> so thank you for your time. And um, congratulations as well. I understand mm. the last two weeks you have yep. become admitted to the bar, you're a barrister uh, and solicitor now in South Australia. So yes. what you're practicing in what type of law? I'm practicing civil and commercial law, mostly in civil litigation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that could be anything. That could Generally be anything. disputes, contracts, building, you name it. Yes. That's good. And you're 41 years of age, uh, married with children, and you've been in Australia for two years? Two and a half years. Two now. and a half mm -hmm. years. And your background was as a, as a politician and a legal background in, in Hong Kong as well? No, I never practiced law Didn't back practice. in Hong Kong. Yeah. I had a law degree, but uh, went straight to politics and became a district councillor and then a legislative councillor. So all my life it's been in politics. Politics, yeah. yeah. And, and, and I, I don't know a lot about the um, political system in mm. Hong Kong, but what's the snapshot? What, is it, what does it look like compared to Australia? So it's quite similar to uh, <coughs> Australian systems in terms of the executive, judiciary and the parliament, except that we only have one parliament and so we don't have the Senate. So uh, in, in the past, I mean, back three years ago, it was a semi-democracy. So I was, I belong to the half that's uh, related, I mean, directly elected and chosen by the people. Mm -hmm. But the other half is kind of appointed by Beijing. So Beijing always has power. There's no such concept as ruling party. Beijing is always the ruling party. But at the same time, tolerating, allowing some, uh, some, some level of uh, free speech inside and outside the parliament but that's been totally overhauled in, in the in the past three years. And that was the case since 99 when- Since 2019. Yeah, so obviously with the national uh, security laws, but, yeah. but uh, the Beijing influence um, started uh, when the handover happened. Uh, that, that were, prior uh, to that, I mean, it was a sort of an English, you know, style of, you know, it was English yeah. colony, so. At the time of the handover mm. and the, at the early time after handover, it's not that bad. Mm. So that's why Hong Kong people kind of believe that, oh, it would stay the same, it's the status quo. Mm. We, we won't have democracies, but we have some high level of freedom and that people are satisfied somehow, even though we, uh, go onto the street and protest a lot, and because we have been promised that uh, ultimately, after some time, we will have uh, a full democracy, one man, one vote, you know, universal suffrage. But it didn't happen. That's why when um, people were protesting, it was like escalating. Mm -hmm. At at early stage, people were more willing to come to the table and do negotiations and not to be very radical. But after a decade, after 15, 20 years, mm. Hong Kongers understands that, oh, Beijing is a liar, mm. then we, we can't trust that anymore. So people became, uh, believed in more radical ways, civil disobedience, like to, to, in, at 2014, the umbrella movement, mm -hmm. and then it developed into, you know, a more serious physical conflict with Beijing yeah. in the street in 2019. And 2014 is around about the time when you sort of became known, I guess, to the public, you know, in a sort of uh, a pro-freedom sort of way a little bit. You had some things to say uh, about that and that, that's really where it started to kick off. That is the umbrella movement. Tell us about that. Yeah, the umbrella movement, it's uh, like a moral call organised by, you know, academics and, and lawyers and religious leaders. So they made a call for Hong Kongers Oh, if this time Beijing has disappointed us uh, so many times in giving us the, the democratic right we deserve, then we should take it to the street. But this time, not in form of a protest, not a one-time protest. We should all sit in in CBD mm. in, in 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 the area called Central, mm -hmm. and then we should not leave uh, until we are forced to, mm -hmm. or we understand that it's. It's civil uh, disobedience, has legal consequences, people may go to jail, mm. but uh, we think that we, we deserve that right and mm. we, we will take that risk. Mm. So it actually happened. At that time, I was not very much involved, even though I uh, happened to represent that area as being occupied. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not a violent protest at all because the, the name is called uh, Occupy Central with Freedom, yeah. with, yeah. with Love and Peace. So it did happen, but we were forcefully, you know, cleared 
by the uh, police brutality, I would say. And quite many of them leaders uh, in that movement were prosecuted and then um, went to jails, not for a very long time at that time, with, without the draconian law uh, in place. So I think they went to jail for like one or two years mm. yeah, within that time. Yeah, and it was called the umbrella movement because people, that was the symbol of the movement. People had the yellow umbrellas and it was yes. a symbol of the freedom yes, movement. Yes, we, we were using the umbrella to defend Protect. ourselves from the pepper spray, yeah. police button. Yeah, it's funny how those things yeah. um, take their own life, uh, take on their own life, I should say. Um, and obviously things developed. I want to get into a little bit about that, but you, you've, you've got a million dollar Hong Kong dollar <laughs> bounty, yeah. about 200,000 Australian dollars yeah. on your head at the moment from mm. the, on your head, you know, as they say, yeah. on, the, on your, uh, r- r- you know, prosecution back in, in Hong Kong. Mm-hmm. Um, that's pretty extraordinary stuff. Uh, and I think actually um, it, it was said by uh, one of the spokesmen over there, Hoi is a criminal and a wanted person at large and has even deceived the court and defied the rule of law. Any person having business engagements or other dealings with Hoi should be extra cautious. So that means we're all we're all in trouble in this room, is it? Yeah. You're eligible to claim that one million dollars. I am. I, well, I'm all right. Well, I didn't come armed, so I'm not going to have to leave it. But, um, I mean, there's obviously a whole background to mm. that. But, um, uh, you know, that, that, that relates to... Uh, your uh, 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 conviction in absentee, mm-hmm. uh, but t- tell us about that. What was the final straw that, that got the you know the powers that be? You fled, and then they decided they'd have this uh, you know yeah th- show so, trial. So at the time I I left Hong Kong, <coughs> um, I I was on bail, mm-hmm. I'm on court bail, mm-hmm. and so I have some Danish politicians invited me to go on for an official uh, duty uh, conference mm-hmm. on environmental issues. So they, they, they meant it to be a plan to help me out. So, and I accepted it. Mm-hmm. And then I left Hong Kong and Hong, Hong Kong government believed that I would return, but I, I declared my exile yeah, during, during the visit. So that's how I left Hong Kong. That's why um, they charged me for jumping bails and contempt of court. Uh, back in Hong Kong. And then after I left Hong Kong and lived my life in exile in Australia, I continued my advocacy work. I continued to meet politicians like, like you, mm. or government officials, human rights groups, and I spoke publicly um, and continued to speak publicly on, on freedoms. That's why the Hong Kong regime is also accusing me of you know, colluding with foreign forces. <laughs> <laughs> and also endangering the Hong Kong Chinese security. Yeah, basically, uh, whenever uh, comments you use to criticize them, they would think that they don't like it. Mm-hmm. And then they will put a charge on you. And I also advocate for, you know, for Hong Kongers not to participating in um, elections anymore because the election system has been changed drastically. So it's basically a rubber stamp parliament yeah. in Hong Kong. Yeah. That's why uh, it's an offense to ask people not to vote. That's why they put um, arrest warrants against me. So this a million dollar bounty is not the first arrest no, warrant. No. It's the seventh, but <laughs> the first time with some money rewards. Yeah. And, and so there's obviously a big build up to that. You've got 2014 with the umbrella movement. And then what happened after that was that did, did things calm down? They seemed to calm down a little bit yeah. on the surface. Mm-hmm. Um, that lasted for what, sort of six months, nine months or something like that, the first stage? It lasted, it, it lasts for years actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I would say a few years of three, four years of um, a relatively peaceful period. Yeah. And during that time, uh, people were developing civil societies and trying to have some breakthrough inside the parliament, even though it's a semi-democracy. Mm. So the game is designed that we will never get. It's very extremely difficult for us to uh, get more than a half seats. Mm. But then we were trying some breakthroughs to, to, to be in a very unfair system, but to get more than a half. And we were very close to it in the 2016 uh, elections. We were very close. That's why Beijing got very nervous. Mm. Yeah, Beijing doesn't want to take any, any uh, tiny risk of us, the, the Democrats, um, taking over the parliaments because that they believe would uh, uh, paradise, uh, mm. paradise that the, 
the whole system. Yeah. So that's why um, they Beijing decided to disqualify all of us, put some of us in jails, and disqualify all of us from from our seats, and pass the dr very draconian you know national security yeah. law. That's the, that's 2019. Yeah, so that's sort of built up to there, and so you were having elections, and you were hopeful of that breakthrough, as you mm. say, and but ultimately, and we remember it well here in 2019 or thereabouts, that this sort of national security law comes in, and there was mm. a lot of outcry here in Australia about mm. that as well, uh, and that's the moment, though, really, isn't it? That's the moment where it seemed from the outside that that the regime were saying enough, we're not even going to. We're not even going to muck around with this anymore. It's just going to be our way. Mm -hmm. um, what what was it at that time that then was it a, sort of an immediate reaction in terms of the demonstrations and the protests? Did, it, did thing or did things build up? Did they simmer for a while? And were people on the streets during the interim period between you know fourteen? It was sort of sporadic protests. Yeah, there have been protests um, every year. Hong Kong is like known by a city of protests. Yeah, so people. Because that's the only way that we can express ourselves without democracy, so people go to the streets. But then during that uh, few years, people still go to the streets. But I would say the sentiment is like people were feeling kind of powerless mm. because after like more than a decade of fight, two decades of yeah. uh, more than two two decades of fight, uh, without achieving anything, mm. so people were quite frustrated. Some started to question or whether we should continue to do this, go onto the street peacefully, and knowing that there won't be any result, knowing mm. that the government is not afraid of a one million uh, people's protests, two yeah. million people's protests. So people started to think more radically. Mm. That's why there was more uh, intense physical concentra uh, confrontations in the street in 2016 causing quite many young people uh, facing charges like rioting mm. and they've been locked up in jail for more than five years, six, five years, six years. Mm. That's the most serious charges that we've, uh, we've seen after the umbrella movements. Yeah. So that's 2016. So that, that was escalating, that was in the middle. And that was only organized by a small group of youngsters. Yeah. But then in 2019, it, it triggered, it, it's, uh, it's over the tipping, the boiling point, yeah. so that uh, it, it became an all people protest. So and people were being, um, you know, taken from the protests and thrown in jail. And are some of them still in jail? Some of those people that are, yeah, yeah. yeah. some of them just got released yeah. uh, recently. But yeah, many of them are still in jail. Yeah, and so we're talking about, as you say, you know, thick crimes like rioting and so on and so forth. Uh, and I, I mean, obviously, there was a time there where there were. Um, you know, I guess people coming in and out of jail and being prosecuted in times. Of ha and you didn't have a lot of that at that time, is that right? At the mm. but between that period, you were sort of able mm. to, despite your involvement in the in the protests, you're mm. able to avoid it. Um, yeah, because I have been a politician. Mm. I've been having uh, a public office in the district council and also in in the parliament. That's why I try to avoid all the, um, the direct confrontations, yeah. but even though I'm, in, I'm one of them, mm. but I'm not like in the front line. Yeah. That's why um, I wasn't caught at that yeah. time. Yeah. But I was faced, only faced with some minor charges like protesting inside the chamber in the parliament yeah. for a charge of contempt of parliament. Mm. That's quite ridiculous, mm. yeah, as, as a parliamentary yeah. myself. Yeah. So uh, some minor charges, but never uh, put to jail. Yeah. yeah. And, there, and there was, a, I think, a, a New Year's Day march on January 2020. That seems to be, from, from what I've seen, where it's, things started to really simmer over. Mm. Uh, tell me about that. Yeah, so I, at that time, the Hong Kong regime made a stupid move. Mm. Um, suddenly, out of nowhere, they, the government introduced a bill that would allow any, anyone in Hong Kong, not only the Hong Kongers, but also expats, um, when they are charged, um, they can be extrad extradited back to mainland China for, for, trial, for a trial there. So it really terrifies, terrifying, terrified people because um, in the past 25 years after the handover, it, it's not a very successful one country, two system uh, design, 
but somehow there's some buffer zones between uh, Hong Kong, mainland China, and Hong Kongers know that uh, whatever ridiculous things happen in Hong Kong, it's it's a Hong Kong jail, a Hong Kong trial, relatively more open. But suddenly the government is saying, introducing this bill, saying that oh, you might be extradited back to China. Mm. Hong Kongers at that time was triggered. That's what I call the the tipping, the yeah. boiling point, or the boiling point, and that no Hong Kongers accepted that. So it started to to heat up at that time in March, uh, 2000, uh, 2019. So more and more people go to the streets. And and, and what what's the practical ramifications for people that don't quite uh, understand that of the difference between say ending up in jail in Hong Kong and ending up in jail in mainland China? What what's the practical difference? Yeah. So even after the handover uh, of Hong Kong back to China, but we inherited um, some British uh, systems. Mm. The jail system, the court systems is very similar to the British system. Mm -hmm. That's why we still would have an open trial, open to the public, so people understand what's going on, what charges are put to you, and appointments of judges. Uh, is more transparent, even though uh, the parliament uh, never got any control, but it was transparent relatively. And then there could be jury trial, but now it's been basically abolished in Hong Kong. So we believe that, oh, at least I know what's going on and what kind of charge I'll be facing, what would happen after I'm in jails. So in jail, even I'm in jails, I can be visited by my families and friends, but if a case uh, happens in uh, for trial in mainland China, you can just disappear like that, and nobody know where you are, and there's no open trial, and there's false confession uh, in front of the TV, and anything can happen. There can be torture, yeah. so people were terrified at that time. Yeah, and that's and that specter of. Uh, Terror, terror been around from the mainland, you know, in terms of Hong Kong people worried about the mainland for a long time. Cause I, I remember vividly going to Hong Kong in, it must have been 2010, and seeing signs up all around the train stations, the metro stations, saying we don't want to be infected with this sort of corruption and this mm. sort of stuff. But I mean, I'm interested in the psyche of the people. It's, it's a very unique situation where you do have you know, effectively a country which is which is effectively China with the British, you know, two, two, two country system, but always, and certainly from 99 and probably before, this the spectre of, you know, China and, and, uh, and the regime on your doorstep. What was it like day to day with family and friends? Did people talk about it? Were they worried about talking about it? Was, was it a, were these taboo subjects talking about the regime, the CCP in, in Hong Kong, or were people open about it? At that time, uh, it was. I, I would still think Hong Kong is quite open and and free, mm -hmm. generally. Not in terms of the political system, but in terms of people's day to day life. People wouldn't be afraid of criticizing government, not in public. People still go uh, uh, go to the streets and you know holding hold up very critical signs against the government officials, make jokes of of politicians or government officials. So people can talk about it. People can express that. I don't want to be a part of China. I don't mm. want to be uh, influenced by the Chinese culture. We are Hong Kongers. Mm. But um, it's just been you know, changed so much yeah. in the past three years. So, yeah. But that's the time uh, that we had. So even up to 2019 or 2020 mm. or thereabouts, things were still relatively open uh, mm -hmm. in terms of people's freedom of speech and expression? They were Correct. At yeah. that time, people were not that afraid. Yeah. Yeah. Even people were angry of not having our democratic right, but people were not afraid of speaking up. What, what's the... Um, I mean, there are a whole range of theories about the increase in rhetoric coming out of the regime, the CCP, but in your mind, what's the thing on a sort of a broader scale politically uh, that that drew the regime to say enough's enough we're not we're not mucking around with this anymore we're going to we're, we're going all in and we're going to take you mm. know take the, the the colony back properly uh, in 2019 20 what what was the thing that happened on mainland china do you think um i it's still a myth mm. why the government introduced that stupid extradition bill yep. allowing us to be extradited back to mainland china that triggered you know, um, vast public anger. Uh, we don't know why. Mm. Maybe it's a mistake of one or two top officials uh, in Hong Kong. Mm. But after all the protests, large scale protests and historical ones, two million people turned up in the streets. Mm. And 
we won the 2019 district council elections. We won like a landslide. Mm. So um, it's the very first time we were in control at the district level. We, uh, the Democrats were in complete control. So Beijing had a taste of what it's like when we Democrats mm. were so overwhelmingly supported by the general public and took all the seats. So what would happen if it happens at the parliamentary level elections? At that time, we Democrats were organizing a, a, a primary so to select the best candidates to, to, take, um, to take the chance of winning, even in a very unfair system, to win half in the parliament. And it, was, it looks achievable to us and it looks uh, feasible uh, as well in Beijing's eyes. That's why it, it touched Beijing's nerve. Mm. So it, it can't happen. So yeah. I'd rather take control, you know, by force or even by violence than having you take control of the parliament yeah. and yeah, paralyze part of the whole society. Yeah, it's just a, a sort mm -hmm. of a, a statement more than anything, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, thing the, the 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 kind of the surveillance increased around that time. You were you were. Mm -hmm stalked effectively I think by some by some reporters uh, yeah. at that time was that was that unusual until 2020 I think that happened was that unusual you know did you experience any mm. watching surveillance prior to then or was that a new thing it's a new thing yeah. it's it only happened after um, 2019 yeah. after all the protests mm. and when the draconian laws been introduced then um, it, within the police force uh, they developed a department called the National Security mm -hmm. Police Department. Um, they, was, they were granted unlimited power, basically. Yeah. So I started to notice changes. Um, so I, there, there's an example I used to, I, I like saying that so that you understand. When I'm, I'm driving a car, I look at the rear mirror more than I look at the front mm -hmm. because they're always behind me, always, day to day. And of course, as a as a public figure and as a as a pro democracy, you know, parliamentarian, mm. um, I I can expect that happening to me, and not only when I'm driving, but uh, at home, you know, I live in an apartment downstairs. There are always some um, police intelligence people mm. uh, or um, you know journalists. Well, I don't know who they are, mm. but when I approach them, ask them who 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 are you. They would never answer you, mm. and when I call the police, but I don't trust the police. But I try. I mm. call the police. Oh, there are stalkers and you know harassments uh, near my home. The police would come and talk to them, and they and told me, oh, they are journalists. They are doing their right job, so mm. you can't interfere with them. So and and I remember one time, uh, I was confronting a car following me, stalking me, and the car hit me slightly, and then I reported it as an accident and. Even that, the police said, oh, they were just journalists and I will let them go. So you can now go mm. without any alcohol, blood test, anything, without them uh, getting off the car, they can go. So you know they are privileged people. They yeah. claim to be journalists, but they were, you know, national security intelligence. What about the, the sort of online surveillance? Are you noticing that, that as well? I mean, you probably wouldn't know, but I mean, it's just intriguing for Australians, I think, to think about that. And we've... You know, I think uh, people are aware of that kind of thing, but it, you know, tell us about that. Um, yeah, you're right that when we were surveilled online, we, we wouldn't know. Yeah. But after 2020, after draconian law, and people, uh, more and more people get arrested suddenly, out, out, out of nothing, I don't know why, and they're on the news saying that, oh, you posted something on Facebook mm -hmm. endangering mm -hmm. national security, that's why they were arrested. And people were quite surprised at that time. What is it, this? What's happening in, to the society? We used to be able to speak without any fear, mm. and but cases like that happened and happened, and people understand that's the new norm. Mm. Uh, there's a paradigm shift, so that people took off all the critical comments and photos of them participating in mm. the past protest um, to to make sure that they're safe because uh, when, when they arrest you uh, under you know the national security law this could be the last moment of freedom that you have 
So it's terrifying. I, I know that feeling because when they arrest me three times at my home, mm. um, I, they were using like morning raids mm. at six, or five or six a.m. in the morning. Mm. They would knock on your door and make a loud noise, threatening to open your door. And then there's, uh, we are arresting you and taking you to the police stations. I was lucky my charges were minor. That's why I, I got bail. But many of my colleagues, parliamentarian colleagues and you know, activists, they were not so lucky. So yeah. suddenly they would just come and take you and then without bail and then you put, you'll be in, under detention for you know, two years waiting for a trial. That's like the last moment of your freedom anytime. Mm. And so, and so you, you're ultimately sentenced in exile. Mm. Um, what would happen if you said, right, I'm getting on a plane, I'm going back to Hong Kong? <laughs> what would happen? What would, what would be the, the upshot of it? Wow. I'm now number one or number two <laughs> on the most wanted list. Mm -hmm. So if any news of me uh, of going home, going yeah. back to Hong Kong, I think it will touch the nerve of the nation, uh, National Security mm -hmm. Police mm -hmm. back in Hong Kong. I, I believe that they would, there will be a big group of police officers waiting for me at the boarding gate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, 30, 50 of them yeah. waiting for me and arrest me and my whole family yeah. at the, the moment I, I board Hong Kong. Maybe not at boarding gates, maybe they will come up to the plane and yeah. got me from yeah. my seat. Yeah, yeah. Uh, family, you don't have any family left in Hong Kong, is that right? Or, or, or any close family? No, not yeah. direct family, yeah. not close yeah. family. That's good. Mm -hmm. and, 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 what, and you still have friends and you have mm -hmm. some friends I think that have been uh, you know, that are still, you know, locked up. Um, mm. There's a couple in particular, I think, that you spoke about on 60 Minutes or mm. I think somebody, yeah. Um, w tell me about them. What, what's their plight? What, what, are, what are their prospects? Some have been uh, locked up for a long time, I think. Yeah, um, yeah. so uh, w w what does the future look like for them? Oh, very bad. Uh, yeah, it's heartbreaking to talk about them. Mm. You know, as as a parliamentarian, you would know. Yeah, yeah they were they were colleagues fighting with you yeah. in the same party in the same camp for many years. Some of them just sat next to me in the in the parliament in the chambers, mm. and we share speeches, we share jokes. So, but suddenly, like they disappeared, mm. they were arrested, and then even before a trial, they've been uh, under detention for two year, two and a half years. Mm. So it's ridiculous and. It's, uh, it's really hard to bear mm. of not knowing when uh, the trial will, will end and mm. what the sentence would be. It would be a decade or seven years or eight years in jails or more, or they can be extradited back to, to China still mm. under this uh, national security law. So very heartbreaking and without, and, but at the same time, they are my motivations. They remind me when I'm living in exile, mm -hmm. I, I cannot live a very com comfortable life. Mm -hmm. I cannot just sit there and do nothing, enjoy my life. And I have to keep fighting for them remotely. And now, especially when the situation in Hong Kong is that bad and people can't speak up, the responsibility goes back to us. When we have the freedom outside, we have to speak for them. Otherwise, no one would. So that's, that's how it feels. And with some friends and uh, families, relatives, they were afraid to have contact with me because all their phones would be tapped, yeah. we assume. <coughs> and so mm, they, they want to ask for my, how, how I'm going. So they want to have a Zoom or WhatsApp yeah. call, but they will refrain from doing so. So maybe through some middle, middle people so, so not to, to not to be arrested. Try yeah. to, and and, and um, I mean, obviously, there's there's a range of people there. It's not just politicians. There are academics, mm. uh, activists, people, just general people from the street. Mm -hmm. You know, just everyday people who've been involved and are still, you know, in, in trouble in that sense. Are there? Um, I mean, that that must have an enormous chilling effect on the discussion, which is a relatively new thing. Mm -hmm. You know, in the last three years, as you say. Um, are you able to get any sort of information about what's happening back through there, or is it is it is it sort of, you know, without giving things away, is it stilted and um, you know the flow of information must be difficult. It's difficult. 
But you're so right. <coughs> now in jail, we have quite a few university professors. We have many lawyers. We have doctors. Yes. We have pilots. All kind of professional. We can you can think of social workers, teachers. Yeah. They're all in jails. So it's it's very ridiculous what's happening in Hong Kong. Uh, in terms of information flow, um, it's very hard for journalists because all the journalists, um, the free printed newspaper uh, was forced to close down. That's Apple Daily, and yeah. Jimmy Lai, the leader, oh, is yeah. in jail for many many years now. And after that, all the pro democracy media organizations was uh, forced to close down. So. In Hong Kong now, the media is very one-sided. Mm -hmm. They are CCP's tongue. They talk about CCP's uh, good stuff only, mm -hmm. and there's no criticism at all. But there are also uh, media organizations, um, predominantly run by Hong Kongers, but based overseas. They are still reporting Hong Kong stuff, uh, but without any journalists being physically able to be in Hong Kong. And for those uh, expats, they were refused their visas, working visas, so they have to move. So it's, they are in a very weird situation. They are reporting Hong Kong and China from Taiwan, from Singapore, but without any physical journalists uh, being there. So it's a difficult situation. So we still have information flow, but they might not be very, very uh, down to earth or authentic. <laughs> are there people still um you know, agitating the issue of democracy inside Hong Kong in a, in a public way? Are there still people that are vocal about these things or has that been completely shut down now? This is very, very rare. Mm. You know, when there are activists and um, maybe not politicians, just activists, they try to have some kind of protest in the streets, but they can't go directly against the, the government. So what they do is like when they were campaigning in the streets, uh, the backdrop of uh, behind them is totally black. Mm. There's no slogan, there's no word uh, on it. And when, when they were delivering flyers, pamphlets, it's basically just white papers. It, it's, more, it's more just like a gesture. Mm. It signifies that to people that oh, don't give up hope, we're still here. Yeah. But we, they, they can put down you know, evidence that can be used by the national security police in, in court for putting them to jails. They are very co uh, courageous in doing so. So every time they're in the streets, they will, they will be like surrounded by you know, 30, 50 police officers watching them, filming them. So one word you, said, you, you, you say it wrong, you'll be in jail. Yeah. And it, 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 presumably there are other coercive measures as well. You, you had, I think, five of your own bank accounts frozen, a little bit like Nigel Farage, who had, you know, was debanked yeah. by his own bank. That, you know, that's a worrying trend, something that I think this regime has used a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's the sort of thing you could expect as well. I mean, I, I'm interested in the, in the kind of, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the other ways of persecuting people. There are sometimes subtle, soft power things that can be done as well like that. Is that a common thing? Were people finding their bank accounts were being... So that was when you left, of course, but, mm -hmm. but does that happen to, you know, people who are treading too close to the line in terms of protests in Hong Kong still? Yeah, I, I'm one of the first batch of people who experienced that, you know, having my bank account being frozen. So at the beginning, it was just like an executive order from the police to the bank. Mm -hmm. So it was not very much legitimate. And, but that's why uh, banks like HSBC were, were under huge international pressure of you know uh, being accomplice to to the um, uh, human right abusing regime but then after a year and a half uh, around that time after i left hong kong so the police applied to the hong kong court for uh, for an order a freezing order so formally under the national security law of freezing my accounts but not only my accounts but my wife and my parents mm. so that's something people can't think of. I, I couldn't imagine that, oh, it's all about me. So, and my wife, my parents were never in public affairs. They, they, they were never uh, public figures. But my involvement in politics and my criticism towards China would get them involved and get their accounts frozen. So you, you can think of Beijing using you know, economic means mm -hmm. as, as a weapon. So if I, 
I, I can't ca catch you uh, to, in jails, and then I would freeze all your assets. So no one in Hong Kong can, can be free. Mm -hmm. So anyone, uh, even Hong Kongers, our Hong Kong community in Australia, when they go to protest uh, at the Chinese embassies, they have to hide their faces, their, their body shapes, their identities, just not to be identified by the Hong Kong regimes because they don't want it from time to time they need to go back to Hong Kong and they have their accounts, they have assets mm -hmm. in Hong Kong, they don't want to be suddenly frozen and you know that's their life saving. So that's that's very threatening to, to Hong Kongers. And and in terms of the uh, you know the, the kind of the surveillance with you know facial recognition and h how far has social credit gone in Hong Kong as compared to the mainland of China? We hear about it all the time, mm -hmm. and how real it is in, in in mainland China and the worry about that that style of government coming to Australia, mm -hmm. and we do, and yeah. I do, I certainly am very worried about all of that just creeping in, but has that, has that style of social credit infected Hong Kong, and, and is it a new thing, if it has? It's a new thing. It's a, it only happened basically after the national security law, mm -hmm. like in 2020, but again, it, it became a new norm, and Hong Kong is catching up with the Chinese, mainland Chinese standards very well, mm -hmm. so there were so-called um, surveillance cameras and they call it smart pillars and mm -hmm. posts everywhere, smart things everywhere, basically cameras everywhere. Mm. So yeah, people would get recognized by, by the machines and we, we don't have a lot of experience of, you know, uh, revealing those situations because the lot of journalists are, journalists are gone, pro, yeah. pro democracy, you know, media organizations are gone. So it's but it's it's happening mm. and and we know it, but that's that nothing we can do about it in Hong Kong. And, and is it as as far as uh, you know you'll be seen um, you know littering and the facial recognition cameras will catch you and then you know your accounts are debited. Is, has it gone that far in Hong Kong yet, or or is it? Uh, you know, is it more a case of the facial recognition cameras would, would capture people when they're protesting, you know, whatever it is. But, you know, we have this view of mainland China, I think in Australia, some of us, that, mm. you know, has the, um, you know, train tickets getting turned off if your COVID pass turns red or green or, you know, all this sort of coercive control uh, um, over people. But, you know, is that, is that something that crept into Hong Kong as well or is it more just people know they're being watched? I think at the moment it's just people know they're being watched and cameras everywhere. Mm. But I I assume that we, they were also using you know smart devices, yeah. AI technologies yeah. online, surveilling people, and yeah, that's what what we assume. Because so it's, it's a small creep, isn't it? Like that that type of technology, and you know we've well, I've spoken about smart cities and 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 the creep of surveillance in this in this country as well. We can see the beginnings of it already in local councils and other areas, and we've seen, you know, the, the UK has, you know, their 15-minute uh, cities. There are all these sorts of things that are that are real. Um, uh, do you think, in your mind, from what you've seen in that creep in Hong Kong, are, are Australians like me who are worried about that right to be worried about the creep of that sort of technology? Is it is it a is it a problem? Uh, it it's definitely can be a potential problem. Mm -hmm. I think um, most people don't like to be watched. Most people don't like to be exposed to public or became uh, public knowledge very yeah. easily. Yeah. And to think that you know any governments, as long as they are in power, they they, they can possibly abuse the power. Mm. And when it's abused, some some wrong can can be can can go back. So um, I would be very cautious um, of what I experience here in Australia. Even though it might not be that bad compared to China, Hong Kong, because it's a democracy. So um, people, what, whatever abuses that were done, a government can be you know voted down. Mm. But still, I I wouldn't be comfortable living in in in, in, a, in a country where I'm always constantly wa being watched. And it is a slippery slope, isn't it? I mean, we see what happens with the declaration of an emergency like COVID. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, the the rule book gets thrown out, uh, and in the name of an emergency, we start losing a lot of those privileges. And if the structure's there, the cameras are there, we can see how mm -hmm. that can be abused mm -hmm. by any government. You know, whether it's Hong Kong, China, or even Australian 
bureaucracies and governments. So it becomes a very slippery slope, I think, as well. Um, we here in South Australia, as you know, have, I think, the biggest footprint of a Chinese embassy in mm-hmm. just down the road, not far from where yes. we are here. Mm. Have you seen it? Have you been past it? Oh, I've been <laughs> protesting there quite many times. <laughs> and I cannot imagine how how huge it is. Yeah. I understand that it's, it's one of, it's, it's the biggest I think it's embassy the biggest in, 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 the, the in the world. Yeah. And I've seen more than like 20 cameras facing, you know, the residents, so face, facing the streets. So every car passed by it, I believe will be recorded. Yeah. Uh, any Anyone in the protest will be recorded. I mean, to give people some idea, it's uh, five standard um, blocks really you know five, you could fit five houses on it mm. it's enormous in one of our most exclusive suburbs st peter's yeah. um you can build a stadium you there. can build a stadium you yeah. almost could build a stadium mm. there um you know you know this regime better than anyone probably in the in the country if not the state state not from the country but mm-hmm. why would the chinese communist party need such an enormous footprint in a place like adelaide i would assume that because it's a defense space you know, it's a spy center, I would say, and so they need to keep watching your defense, you know, facilities mm-hmm. and uh, infiltrate into your people and get your technology and your information. That's one thing. Mm-hmm. The other thing is we have the largest, you know, Uyghur community here, mm-hmm. and all the dissidents. They need to watch them, and I, I assume it's a spy center and. They, they gather information of you know foreign country like that. Do you feel any um, any watchfulness? Do you feel like you're being surveilled here even now in South Australia? Um, not in terms of I have to turn my back and mm. look at who's behind, but I I also assume that whenever I'm in a public place uh, doing protest, mm. if I have uh, made it public that I would go to one place at one particular time. They would send people there to see or what Ted, Ted Hoi speaks about mm. and report it back to the Chinese embassies and take some photos and who's with Ted Hoi and his family there. They can, these can be useful information for their threatening strategies and so that they know who to arrest that would uh, threaten you and to make people around you not to trust you and terrify people around you when, when they talk to me. Yeah. I think that's still happening. Yeah. And, and uh, we hear now a lot about the, uh, the thawing of relations, if you will, between Australia and China and you know, some trade things coming back on, online. Um, but ultimately, it does need to be remembered, does it not, that um, we are dealing with this regime. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. we understand it's good for people to be able to sell goods and, you know, free trade is a good thing. But ultimately, um, this is a, a regime that's doing a lot of bad stuff. Mm-hmm. What's your view on the relationship Australia should take with China and the Chinese Communist Party? I mean, when, you know, obviously we're talking about the regime rather than Chinese people, but, um, you know, should Australia be taking a stronger stand against some of the human rights abuses? Mm-hmm. Uh, and if so, what, what, what do you think sort of stand should be taken? My, my take is that uh, Australia cannot take it as a business as usual. It is not a business as usual when so many are suffering, not only from not only those Hong Kongers and many dissidents and the Uyghurs communities mm. and the people of Taiwan has been threatened by military threats every day. It's not business as usual. So. Um, China is a threat to the world, not a friend, and definitely not a friend of Australia. But of course, uh, as, as politicians, I, I'm pragmatic. I understand that trades can, can, um, need to be done. And you know, economic growth, economic partnerships, uh, we, somehow uh, Australia is relying on China. But then bear in mind that uh, not to embrace China as a friend and be very cautious about you know inf- uh, infiltrations that's happening. So in in a soft uh, economic way, mm-hmm. influence influencing shaping um, Australia into something we don't want to see. Mm-hmm. There's a, a concept of the United Front, um, which you know is the soft power arm of the CCP. Mm-hmm. Um, and we know there's a presence all through Australia and South Australia, there is a, a presence of that. Uh, the aim being, as it was described to me, to not necessarily take 
um, the everyday person to loving the regime, but perhaps to take them from hating to being neutral about the regime, almost sort of soft power approach. Mm -hmm. Um, that's very real, isn't it? I mean, those those tentacles are everywhere, and um, that includes the business community being mm -hmm. touched by them, um, yes. the political community. Um, have you seen any signs of that when your time is here? Or do, I mean, do you, do you yeah. sort of? So, not to mention about those already on the news, you know, businesses being bought up, and but you know, uh, at the time I spent in Adelaide. I've been involved and been invited to attend some multicultural dinners and networking events. I, I remember in one event um, when there are um, mainlander uh, Chinese leaders uh, being one of the participants, participants, and then I'm invited to the same dinner. But then the Chinese leaders here uh, have told the host that saying that, oh, Ted Ho is a criminal, why are you inviting him? Mm. So you understand, mm. even in a multicultural context, mm. there are something the Chinese embassy is working on mm. to exclude people like me, so mm. exclude people who are anti-China or pro democracy mm. So that's happening. It's not hard to imagine. Yeah. Um, I guess uh, what I was going to ask you about, um, you know, about the sort of United Front probably drifts into more about the uh, the Uyghur community here as well. We've got. Uh, as you say, I think I think the largest uh, Uyghur community in uh, in the country in 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 uh, South Australia, and of course, I think it's too easy for people to forget the the genuine suffering there as well. Mm -hmm. um, the regime is going on. Is is Australia doing enough um, to help the the plight? And is there more that can be done? I mean, it, I think Australians mm -hmm. sometimes feel as though it's a it's a David versus Goliath battle, mm -hmm. um, but. You know this stuff's horrendous. We've got people who've been yeah. locked up for and being, you know, you name it, tortured, abused. Um, uh, you know, should Australia be doing more? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's already better if you compare the situation perhaps back in five years yeah. or ten years. I think at that time, quite many Australians would regard China as a real friend, mm. as a genuine friend. Yeah. But now most people are aware that it's a, it's a threat. But then. When Australia is still trading with, with Beijing, it's easy to, to, to lose itself. Um, so, I mean, what Austra the Australian government can do is to continue to make strongest statements in public in, among the international communities. Mm -hmm. Whenever things um, like a bounty on my head mm -hmm. happens when, whenever like Jimmy Lai is put to trial or be sentenced for decades of imprisonment. I think they, they, it's, it's like a moral responsibility to speak up mm -hmm. in, in spite of, you know, uh, poking the bear yeah. um, of, you know, the risk of not having a deal with Beijing in, 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 with industries. But it's a moral responsibility to speak up. And I would say it might not be very realistic with sanctions put up. Um, we have the Magnitsky law just passed, mm -hmm. never been used, but I think to, to be used on China officials, individuals, it's very much worth it to, to support Hong Kong. Your um, hope and dream is to one day go back mm -hmm. to Hong Kong um, and, uh, and, you know, and, and, and perhaps even return, who knows, but um, how do you see that playing out? How, how is that realistically going to be um, achieved? And uh, you know, are, are, you, are you hopeful? Are you hopeful uh, about that? I am hopeful, mm. for, and I might be um, considered romantic, <laughs> romantically hopeful mm. that I I will return home one day. Yeah. But that's not it's not, not a goal. That's that's a pledge I make to myself if I work hard enough to talk to more people and um, try harder on my advocacy work so that the world hears and sees Hong Kong, then there's a possibility that we are strong enough to fight back. But then I would still think, one, um, as long as CCP is in place in Hong Kong, there's no freedom in Hong Kong. Mm. There's no room for negotiations or any hope of negotiations. Um, the, the goal is for CCP to step down from power. I think that's the only way. That's why I've been talking to people about you know, isolating China, mm. about sanctioning China, 
so that it steps down, it dies down itself, mm. Mm. so that at that time people can be free and I can go back home in glory. I don't think that's very um, un unrealistic, mm. and I think it's going. It's happening. Mm. You know, you see China's economy is going down, and how isolated they are. And I believe that dictators without democracy always makes mistakes. Yeah, yeah that's irreversible. Yeah, I'm yeah. waiting for that day to come. Yeah, well, we all hope that uh, you're right about that and that you do get that opportunity. And thank you for, um, for coming in and sharing your story. It's, a, it's an incredible one. Um, you don't seem like a very dangerous man to me, so <laughs> I, I think that million dollars is probably misplaced. But thank you, Ted, and all the best. And uh, congratulations again on, on the new yeah. career. Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah.